Excellent. So this is the panel discussion. So we've got about time for an hour's discussion. Um, we're going to try and keep it lively, so we'll try and avoid too long a monologues and this sort of thing. Um, but I'd like to start by giving everyone a chance to introduce themselves, for those of you, despite our extremely esteemed panel, um, you may not know everything about them. So perhaps a, a one-line introduction and um, uh, maybe even something about uh, one line on uh, uh, what your main interest is in the Bayesian deep learning. Okay, my name is Max Spelling. I am at the University of Amsterdam, and we are working on uh, b building Bayesian deep neural networks, I guess. So. My name is Ryan Adams. I'm at Harvard University, and I'm interested in Bayesian nonparametrics and uh, neural networks and Gaussian processes and their interface, sort of all the different ways we can glue these things together. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Miguel, I'm a university lecturer at Cambridge and uh, I have a general interest in Bayesian neural networks, uh, deep probabilistic models, uh, deep Gaussian processes and approximate inference. I'm Ian Goodfellow, I'm a research scientist at OpenAI. I'm interested in all kinds of high dimensional probability distributions including the posterior over the parameters given the data. Hi, I'm Shakir and I'm uh, a research scientist at DeepMind, and I'm interested, um, as I just spoke, at the intersection of deep learning, Bayesian analysis, and reinforcement learning, and to see the kind of tools we can get in that space. Great, and I'm Neil Lawrence, and uh, I'm moderating, and uh, uh, I'm interested in Gaussian processes and deep Gaussian processes, but not for this moment. Now I'm going to instigate uh, discussion. So. Um, this is just a classic MIPS thing, isn't it, basically? But there's two ideas that are out there. There's deep learning and there's Bayesian learning, and all we ever do as a field is just merge the most recent two things and claim it's the most brilliant thing ever and uh, that everyone should be doing it. And there's a bunch of new people in the audience, so they've not seen this before, so the suckers will pick it up and run with it, and you'll get lots of citations. Um, and as the previous <laughs> questioner, Julian, said, you can What's do far problem? better with just with uh, ensemble methods. So uh, um, I'm going to go to Max with that. So is that true, or is that is there something really here? I think there is something really here. I think uh, so. Chris and I uh, here in the front row, actually, we tried out uh, to compare uh, doing the proper Bayesian thing, um, and then also we simply tried, you know, uh, the frequentist thing, which is basically do bootstrap sampling, compute many models, and uh, get your uncertainties from there. And, you know, both work. It's not a, you know, both have their place, I think. Um, it's, it's a philosophical debate in some sense. You could argue that uh, it's a bit more expensive to have to, you know, train many models. But then on the other hand, for Bayesian models, you have to sample from the posterior. So that might be expensive as well. But I ne not necessarily fall into one camp. If, if the one is more practical than the other, then you know, no problem. OK, so maybe, so what's the theory of that? Um, you know, when do, when do practitioners know what to do? Why should they pick up these models? Um, and what's the need to deploy them at the moment? And when should they just do an ensemble? I mean, to anyone. I think if you're um, interested in, the pro in uncertainty in your predictions, I certainly think frequentist methods are perfectly fine. If you're really interested in model selection, for instance, uh, you know, how many layers in your network, how many neurons and stuff like that, then Bayesian uh, paradigm is quite helpful, I would think. Uh, maybe, oh, Ryan, go ahead. I, I was just going to say kind of the same thing, where uh, in situations where you'd like to do model selection, then I think that's something you, you get from the, the Bayesian setup, although obviously ideas like cross-validation in some ways feel not so dissimilar for bootstrap for also doing model selection. I might also point out that sometimes in, it, it does come up in the Bayesian setting where uh, you get interesting sort of closed form predictions and closed form accounts for uncertainty that you can then use downstream uh, in, in other things. So that's, um, I mean, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that these uh, uncertainty estimates obtained by Bootstrap, I think they can be uh, quite good in terms of uh, making uh, predictions about some quantities, but I think if you have uh, latent variables and you have to connect different models uh, that share different variables. I think the bootstrap approach, uh, I don't think it's going to be that good at solving this problem. Ian, thoughts? Uh, well, an ensemble can be essentially a collection of n different points in the posterior distribution, and if you properly weight the votes from each of the members of the ensemble, then 
You can interpret it as being an approximation to the correct Bayesian prediction. You can think of the kinds of things that is the default with neural nets right now to be sort of a map approximation. And so in that sense, um, a properly weighted ensemble can get closer to the actual integral that we're trying to predict there. Uh, so it's just kind of an empirical question of does an ensemble with average weights perform better or worse than an ensemble with the correct Bayesian weights? Yeah, that's a good question, because often it performs better, embarrassingly. Um, so uh, any thoughts on that yourself, Ian, or anyone else? I mean, not uh, saying for the, the neural network case, but in other cases. As a practitioner, I often find that the thing that performs the best is something that's very near what theory tells you you should do, but not exactly what theory tells you you should do. And I don't always know why that happens. Okay. Hi, Neil. Uh, so I'm one of the authors of the ensemble paper, so maybe I can add some comments. So the another difference from what Max mentioned is uh, Bayesian model averaging is kind of like soft model selection. So Tom Minka and others have made this point, which is it's quite different from model combination. So they are quite different in other cases as well. Like in the limit of infinite data, Bayesian model averaging tends to, I mean, assuming there are not equally likely parameters, it's going to put all its mass on like one parameter, whereas in, even in the infinite data limit, an ensemble would combine M models, and that's another difference. So it, it could think of it as slightly different hypothesis space. So if the hypothesis space doesn't truly match the data generating distribution, then an ensemble might be more robust in that sense. And people have done this kind of thing. Um, uh, I, we can f I, I found similar things with my experience with like Bayesian random forest versus uh, decision trees and so on. So there are some work comparing the approximation error of Bayesian model averaging versus model combination in cases where the model is misspecified and uh, ensemble combination is more robust in those cases. So that's, we can't ignore the effect of model misspecification. Good point. Um, Shakir, you've had longer to think about the question now. Um, I have nothing further to add. As I said, I want to be a pragmatic Bayesian. So these methods just tell us that we cannot learn posterior distributions right now and we will just get better over time. So, but, but is that true? I mean, uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that, that there's, and it relates to Balaji's point, I think that these, uh, there's a fundamental philosophical difference between what you're trying to do. This issue about the posterior collapsing down around a delta point as you get to infinite data in one case and not in another is, shows that there's something different going on, right? Um, yeah, okay, in this case, if you want to always be thinking about IID data, then these kind of issues are going to come about. But what was I was interested in is this continual learning system. You're never going to have this situation, so you're effectively always going to be dealing with collections of small data sets. You'll need to be learning online. And when you want to build a unified system integrated in different ways that have multiple different reasoning systems, then the Bayesian method combined with deep learning makes it very easy to form these integrated systems because naturally they all fit together. Yeah, okay, now I'm not sure I accept that because uh, you're just going to have to increase the number of parameters uh, forever as you get more and more data. And uh, not only that, these uh, forms of Bayesian deep learning you've been talking about are parametric. You can't just add parameters in willy-nilly. Yes, and this is the limitation of our current science, right? You know that as you are learning, you need to form hierarchical models because then concepts need to be formed. They need to simplify the data. We can't only deal with parametric models. We also need to have non-parametric models. This is something we learn from neuroscience, actually. They call this the complementary learning systems approach. And if you want to have a, like a brain, for example, is a complementary learning system. We have a non-parametric system, for example, your hippocampus in that memory. You have your long-term memory system and then you need to have these composed together, they learn together, they transfer together, and this is ultimately the solution, which is why I'm a fan of semi-parametric modeling, building mixtures of Gaussian processes and neural networks and Dirichlet process mixtures. We just need to figure out the inference to really scale these things and be pragmatic about how we'd go about doing these things. You could imagine making a recurrent attention mechanism that reads parameters out of a buffer, and it can just read more times when it needs to, that you can specify where the buffer ends and keep changing where the buffer ends. Would that give you, um, I, don't, I have to admit, I don't know enough about attention mechanisms to know, uh, but would that give you this effect where you don't continually, um, as you see new data, that your posterior doesn't collapse in attention networks if you do Bayesian versions? 
I think your your Bayesian your Bayesian posterior probably would actually collapse with more and more IID data because you'd find more and more evidence for one particular point in parameter space. Yeah, I'd like to say, I don't like the term IID data. I think we should use exchangeable because as Bayesians, IID doesn't exist unless we're modeling independently. Uh, so I'm just revealing. I, no, as you as Bayesians, uh, this IID thing doesn't exist. I'm the provocateur um, unless you're modeling independently. So I think exchangeable is a better term, right? So. Um, uh, Max, do you have comments on, on, on what was said so far, or I can sort of move the subject I, on? I think a bit? I want to subscribe to what was just said. Um, there is great work by Peter Grunwald, I'm not sure if he's here in the audience, but you have studied these Bayesian models under misspecification, where things actually can go badly wrong and convergence can be very slow. Um, and so, since you're always misspecifying uh, your model, uh, this is something to be really careful of. Typically, I think if you're just interested in prediction, then actually doing a frequentist ensemble is typically better. I mean, it's the same thing between AIC and, and MDL, where MDL is far more restrictive and conservative, and AIC leaves much more uh, sort of models in place. And if you then average over all of these models in terms of prediction, performance typically tends to be better. But it's a different application. Now, if you're, doing, if you're trying to do model uh, sort of... Uh, selection, then I think the Bayesian method is still the, the ideal way to go. At least it's more efficient than doing a full cross-validation of, uh, of many things. That's a, I, and that's a nice, I think Peter's work is much under-read, um, particularly yes. his stuff on frequential theory. And there was this wonderful paper a few years ago on the catch-up phenomenon, comparing um, cross-validation as a model selection criterion against the Bayesian evidence. And there's an enormous amount of insight about how these things differ in that work. I, I recommend everybody to read that work. It's very important. Other thoughts on that specific subject? Or? I was going to take it in the direction of one of uh, Shakir's slides, which I took a photograph of here. Um, I quite, well, the slide had, uh, it was fantastic. We started with scene understanding, data efficient learning, exploration, relational learning, semi patrometric learning, hypothesis formation, causal reasoning, macro actions and planning, visual concept learning and world simulation. <laughs> so that's kind of it, isn't it? It, it? That's the whole thing in there. Um, job done. This is what, we, now we know what they're doing at DeepMind. Um, is, is this feasible? And uh, if so, across what time scale? <laughs> the whole conference has been about these topics. So I think as a community, we are working together on all of these topics. I've seen them. This last ICML. Mr. Bit, can we do it all the Bayesian way? I mean, my, the impression I got, I agree with all these things, they're really important, but the, the impression I got is you're saying this is all falls down under the Bayesian sword. There is a Bayesian solution for all these methods. And the cleanest way to make sure that you have a single unified system will be to do the Bayesian way, because the only way to build a consistent system that has a correct consistent set of beliefs over multiple different tasks, like E.T. Jane says in his book, is to be Bayesian. Well, you don't need to call it Bayesian, but you just need to use the rules of probability correctly, which is all I want to do. <laughs> you see, I might have believed that was true, but then people built these deep neural nets and said, hey, I just have to share these input layers across a different task, and you know, I just retrain it a little bit using TensorFlow, and I've got all these GPUs. And you know, the promise of that has just not borne out. We built systems over years to bring graphical models together um, in order to deliver on this. Um, I mean, this idea of composable learning is not new. It was the promise of graphical models, and we utterly failed to deliver. So in some sense, while what you're saying is true, you, uh, you know, this whole conference is now dominated by an alternative approach that doesn't push those uncertainties around. So. Why I don't that? see deep learning as any different. Deep learning, we all know from the old papers of Jordan, is a graphical model. And there's, there's, you know, if your thinking is unified because deep models are themselves probabilistic models, which is why everything we have makes it so easy to combine Bayesian reasoning because they are themselves probabilistic models. So again, the pragmatic Bayesian needs to ask what exactly needs to be uncertain because not everything needs to be uncertain. We are going to be making decision making, so you need to have uncertainty about decision making systems. Maybe we don't need to have uncertainty over certain parameters. This is the kind of question, but at the high level, this level of composability has always been true. Deep learning actually shows you that that is really possible because when you have auxiliary tasks, multiple deep networks, sharing them together, they're all trained through the principle of maximum likelihood.
right? So that has borne out wonderfully, and we're only going to make it better. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, so, so, I can see you want to come in there. No, well, I would just wanted to, to sort of echo this in a slightly different way, which is I think, I think the, it has been the case that graphical models and probabilistic models are composable, and that has been a success. What hasn't been a success historically is the composability of inference in those models, right? Um, and, but as a, as a principle for modeling the world, it is true that they're composable. The, uh, it's just been the case that I think inference has been slower, right? And m to have successful models, it has tended to be the case that each individual version, composable or not, needed to have its own bespoke inference algorithm. Uh, and whether that means coming up with a sufficiently fast MCMC sampler that takes advantage of particular properties or deriving a mean field variational approximation or whatever it is, that's been hard. But the last couple of years have seen uh, a variety of advances from probabilistic programming to black box variational inference to varieties of, of approximate MCMC that have started to make it feel possible that we could do, well, you could just glue together different kinds of graphical models and glue those together with uh, different kinds of neural networks and actually expect to get to get interesting answers. The job is not done, to be sure, but I think I, I think the gap has been on has definitely been on the computational side and not on the sort of modeling side. Gail, can I bring you in a bit on this? Uh, um, you've uh, sort of, uh, I guess, more recent to the field than some, uh, and someone who's studied a lot of these probabilistic uh, approaches. What's your feeling about uh, whether to quote David, who uh, I thought Ryan gave a wonderful tribute to earlier, um, his original point when Gaussian processes were introduced was this, are we throwing out the baby with the bathwater quote that I think several people have used um, to motivate the return to deep learning. Well, one thing I'm curious about is these new approaches that Ryan mentions, these uh, black box variational inferences, all these sort of things. Do they really give us the full Bayes back, or are we sacrificing Bayes by introducing composability within the model? Um, okay. Um, so I think uh, it's uh, one, of the, one of the limitations of the uh, uh, a lot of the uh, kind of uh, Bayesian methods like Gaussian processes uh, where this uh, ability to learn these uh, feature representations. I think now with uh, recent advances in uh, approximate inference, we are able to apply, uh, to, make a, to use Bayesian methods in more complicated models that have this uh, uh, different, uh, can, can learn different uh, levels of uh, representations. I think these advances will uh, get us closer to improve uh, the limitations of these uh, Gaussian processes that uh, failed to learn these uh, representations. I think in the next years we are going to, we have already been seeing uh, a lot of advances in methods for approximate inference. Uh, we have seen now very flexible uh, variational approximations that uh, have almost uh, got very close to uh, the unbiased uh, unbiasedness of uh, sampling-based methods, and I think in the next uh, years we'll, we'll be able to do very accurate inference in these uh, complex models with, different, with many different layers. Right, Max. So I'm actually a little bit skeptical that um, if we do variational or any other, or maybe MCMC inference over a neural network with a million parameters, we are doing much more than a fancy way of regularizing our neural net. So for us in computer, you know, in machine learning, this might be sufficient. I don't know, but as a statistician, you want to know, you know, is the am I actually approaching the true posterior everywhere in this gigantic space, and is this calibrated? Um, and I believe it's not. And I think we are maybe fooling ourselves in this respect. Um, and what I really should call for is just a benchmark or a competition or metrics to even compare two methods because that's in this field really poor. I mean, we take some UCI data sets and we are guilty of this ourselves too. You know, we compare and we compute some uh, log probability and then we say, ah, we do better than uh, somebody else. But then actually we did some experiments and then, you know, we took, uh, and I think uh, uh, Yarin did the same thing. So you, you take an image and then you rotate the image and then you look whether the uncertainties blow up, right? If, if something is no longer a two and then you find if it's rotated at a certain angle, it thinks with high, very high probability is it seven. And it's not a seven, right? The two, the two you know, did not become a seven by rotating it. 
And so it's not calibrated very well. It's not doing very well in terms of uh, uncertainty. And I think we are just ignoring that fact. And what we really need is a bunch of you know, clear metrics and some you know, good benchmarks so that we can actually start comparing with each other. So I guess a, a slightly different take on this is that I don't think anybody who thinks hard about approximate inference imagines that we're really ever going to see all of the posterior of any interesting model. Uh, as a field, whether we're talking about deep neural networks or latent Dirichlet allocation, these are giant non-identifiable models, right? And, uh, and, and so in addition to, so there's two kinds of things I think we often, often conflate. One is this idea of sampling from the entire space and maybe estimating partition functions and things like that. And then there's a certain amount of sampling that gives us a local representation of uncertainty. And that's what we actually do. And for the kinds of problems that machine learners often tackle, uh, we tend to be happy with that. We don't ask our models to actually sample from the space of all permutations of the hidden layer, for example, and things like this. Like, there's a huge amount of, of redundancy going on there, some of which is easy to identify and some of it is, is not. Uh, the issue is that I think we don't have a language for talking about that kind of uncertainty representation. That we've adopted the statistical view of this in which uh, in, in which we want to have these identifiable models with, you know, log concave uh, posteriors in which we can have fast mixing and we can talk coherently about, uh, you know, about kind of the guarantees we get as we explore all of that and all our estimators have nice properties. But in general, everything we're talking about here is never, you know, it's just not in that regime at all. And yet we haven't developed a, a sort of coherent way to talk about this, this, this different regime that we're in. And I should also say that I think the, it, it's, it is tempting to, to sort of you know, talk about, oh, I don't know what I'm getting out of variational methods and things like this. But I think a larger point is that we've always made compromises uh, in these kinds of models forever, forever whether we're talk, you know, going back to things like conjugate exponential families, right? Nobody believes that the world, you know, that our likelihoods or our priors are really these simple, have these simple forms. But we, we are always willing to cut corners in, in the name of computation. And it's just, it's just that the, the, the set of corners available to us to cut has been increasing. Yeah. I think that's a, a very good point. And I think it also relates a little bit to the frequential work you mentioned earlier, because that's all about prediction, which is why it's very interesting for machine learning people. And when you talk about posteriors over parameters, we don't really care about those parameters. In the, They're just a way of creating a flexible model. And it's much more akin to the frequential, which I think is why it's sort of odd we don't look at that more. But the second point I think you made, Max, about um, task is also a difference between us and the statisticians. A statistician will always talk about their task before they talk about their model. And, uh, and you sort of mentioned we don't have benchmarks. And I think a statistician in this audience would be thinking, you know, you know th these people don't even define their objective. And then they talk about how they're going to model, which is a sort of bizarre thing. Um, but, but let's think about a task, right? So um, as a self-driving car company, what you really want is that your car, you know, uh, on day uh, 2075 doesn't drive itself into a tree because it actually hasn't ever seen this configuration and it doesn't recognize that it's uncertain about it. That's a clear task, right? But it's not so easy, I think, to actually, you know, get around. Because if you have a deep neural net, you know, um, how are you going to explore or even evaluate how good that posterior is and how good all those uncertainties and all these new situations are? I think it's, that's a daunting task. Well, it's a clear task, at least. But um, Yeah, I think uh, that we really need uh, better tools for uh, evaluating the uh, accuracy of the estimates of uncertainty in our models. And I can give an example. Uh, for example, in finance, uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, uh, estimating risk and how accurate uh, the uh, risk estimates are. I think uh, some of uh, similar techniques could be, for example, probably applied in this area to really uh, quantify the quality and uh, accuracy of the estimates of uncertainty. I think those could be, for example, interesting uh, directions. One very challenging and somewhat specialized benchmark for the quality of confidence estimates that we get is examining the confidence of the model on adversarial examples, inputs that have been perturbed slightly in a way that's intended to fool the model. And usually the model has its confidence just explode and become really irrationally overconfident. Uh, Nicholas Paperno and I have developed a library called Clever Hans, uh, named in honor of a horse that everybody thought could do arithmetic when really he couldn't. Um, 
It's in the OpenAI GitHub organization under the repository named Clever Hans. And you can download that and it will generate adversarial examples for you to use for a benchmark of any model you'd like to test. And it would be really impressive if there was a Bayesian model that was capable of actually getting uh, good confidence estimates on these really, really challenging inputs. This comes back to Shakir's point from earlier, which is about composability. You need good calibration between these different aspects to ensure that when you compose that you're going to get the expected behavior. And if that doesn't happen, largely speaking, all bets are off, which is, I think, a lot about the fragility of the Bayesian framework. But another critique I would make is that, okay, in a lot of these cases, you don't even know which way you, t typically it's, it's really difficult to calibrate these uh, uncertainty estimates well. Um, and very often, you may prefer to go in a certain direction. Like I think in Bayesian optimization, we see these things aren't well calibrated always, but we'd prefer to be over uncertain rather than under uncertain. Um, and I think that this is a further challenge, isn't it? The, the way in which we fail is task dependent. So, so how does that map to your idea uh, about composability in these models, Shakir? I've been saying this for years, but I will do it come in the next few months. So I think the solution is, again, is not that it's Bayesian methods, but it's the way we are setting up this problem. It is, why is it reasonable to expect that a method that you have asked to do a discrimination will be robust to all sorts of things that it has never been trained on? Its universe does not include those images. So you need to give it knowledge of what its universe should be, and the way to do that, or one way to do that, is to build a density model on the side of the classifier. The density model will tell you what is probable in the world and what is not. Then in this case, I'm actually a frequentist because I actually think the right solution is to then take the density, estimate from it the expected number of data points that, like a test point that I have seen, form the world confidence interval and report that instead. And what I hope and what I will do for you in the next to prove it to everyone is that you, know, you will see that the adversarial network, even though it looks to us like an image, statistically it is not like the data it has been trained. So the density model then should tell us that no, it has seen two data points like this. The wall confidence interval goes zero to one and that's the end of this discussion. Right. So this is what I think. It's about building these complementary systems. So you have a classifier, a density model. They operate together. It's the same thing that I expect to happen in reinforcement learning. And you know, well, I don't have much more to say. It's just an idea. Right. <laughs> so at the adversarial training workshop, there is actually a paper about adversarial examples for density models. So you can, you can fool the model into thinking that there's high density where there's not. Um, but actually, I wanted to say one follow-up on uh, Neil's comment about uh, that you'd rather be uh, underconfident rather than overconfident. Another thing that can simplify the problem of choosing the confidence level is that we can often get away with having the absolute value of the confidence estimates be really, really wrong as long as the ranking is correct. Uh, that we can tell which examples are more confusing than others and then ignore the most confusing ones. Great. I mean, we're half an hour in. I feel we're just getting warmed up. But um, maybe if there's any questions from the audience at this uh, stage, can you go to the microphone if you've got a question? And then. Uh... Um, I have a feeling that the, one of the problems that was mentioned that we must estimate uh, uh, with confidence those posteriors everywhere <laughs> in hugely dimensional spaces from a handful of points, because when you have 100 dimensions, anything is a handful. <laughs> and uh, we, as humans, are actually able to do it. But the impression that I have is that we, as humans, have a huge amount of prior information available. Uh, priors, for example, just considering vision, there are strong uh, uh, smoothness, uh, priors, and priors about how optics actually work and light uh, travels in straight lines in our world, at, at least, and that uh, up and down is not very symmetric, but left and right is more or less symmetric, etc. And yet, when we give priors to our models for mathematical and computational needs, we give priors that reflect uh, mathematical or computational 
convenience or expressibility, isn't there a mismatch between the priors that we want to give to our models and the priors that we are able to give to our models, and how can we bridge this gap? I guess my view is that things like convolutional neural networks are exactly specifying those kinds of priors, right? It's specifying a compact parameterization of a complicated space, um, building in knowledge of different kinds of invariants. And I think we're seeing, often in many different kinds of problems, it's hard to identify those, that kind of structure. Uh, I, I, I broadly agree, this is, this is important for anything ever working, that building in more assumptions and being clear about what our assumptions are and, and leveraging them is, is, is important. Um, but I do think this is something that, that is, is, is ongoing and in some ways, I mean, you know, at, at a high level, people often talk about, you know, we're often talking about deep learning, but really deep learning in some ways means convolutional neural networks, which have been the most successful things over the last several years. And, and one might say that a lot of that success is precisely because so much of the structure of the problem is being built into it. Zubin. So I'm wondering, uh, um, just I give a historical talk, so it makes me think historically for the day. Um, in the 80s and 90s, everybody was very excited about neural networks, but they weren't actually being used to do anything useful. I mean, a very, very few examples of you know, industrial applications or anything like that. People just thought they're really cool, they're the answer to intelligence, et cetera. And, um, what changed was that we have much faster computers and much more data, among other things. Now, um, people are saying, oh, well, Bayesian methods are expensive and so on, but maybe we just have to wait it out because computers are getting faster. And if we have faith that this is actually a good approach for handling uncertainty and you know, reasoning about uh, our forecasting uncertainty and compositional probabilistic uh, inference and so on. We just wait till those great hardware people come up with better hardware and we'll be fine. What do you think of that? I'm, I'm thinking how old I am, but Ian's younger. Uh, so having recently uh, been a co-author of a textbook, I was forced to think about history a lot more than I usually would. And uh, I'm in the funny position of being young enough that I didn't watch a lot of the things happen that many people here watched happen. I think part of why deep learning became so popular over the last five or six years is actually because of the growth of data sets. That uh, prior to the rise of deep learning, kernel machines were very popular. And on tasks where there were not very many labeled examples, the fact that the gram matrix requires the construction of O of n squared entries wasn't really that much of a hindrance. But then when we moved up to things like ImageNet with 1.2 million examples, uh, the fact that neural nets in, in some sense scale sublinearly with the data set size because for a very large data set you may not even need to pass through it once to train the neural net, uh, that started to make neural nets much more appealing. Um, so to the extent that Bayesian methods that scale nicely with the size of the data set can be developed, then uh, the increase in hardware can justify the expense of the Bayesian method. But methods that continue to scale poorly with the size of the data set will um, have data set size make them slower at the same time that hardware makes them faster. Okay. Yeah, so um, maybe I'll come back to say that, that question a bit later. So for me, it's sort of the, the there's one reason that's going on here is that you have to think about what the inferential principle that you are dealing with. And when you are doing deep learning, whether it's building RNNs or building convolutional networks, there's one principle of inference and that was maximum likelihood. And that was a very simple process, which means you didn't have to do a lot more work to go beyond it. But when we are Bayesian, now we ask a slightly harder question, which means we had to do a lot of work to actually scale beyond maximum likelihood to maintain a posterior arm. But today, there's almost no Bayesian method that is more expensive than doing maximum likelihood. So I think we've done a lot of work in the last few years, especially in variational inference, to try and build very flexible models um, to address this question, but it's still not perfect, right? We still do not have good inference for non-parametric models. And maybe this is going to Pablo's question, which is, um, you know, where do priors come from? And you either give the prior or you try to learn the prior from data. And we need to get these very flexible methods, and there's a lot more work of inference to do, 
to do that, which is why black box inference has enabled a lot of methods, which is why I tell people that it should be the default method for inference because it is no more expensive than doing anything else. You don't need to wait. You can do everything that you can do in deep learning today in a Bayesian way, but you know, there's, still, there's always more to do. Something, Brian. I, I might quickly sort of respond to, to what Ian just said. So, I mean, if deep, deep models are currently trained by a variant of, the, of the, the likelihood principle that is not so different from being Bayesian, and if we believe that there's sublinear in the number of data, then that essentially guarantees that Bayesian methods essentially eventually win as computers get faster, right? Because that means that the gap, that the, the gap between them as a function of data starts to become small. Right, and that, and that there's just a point at which that gap is that gap is tiny, right? Because that's saying that saying it's sort of concave, uh, you know, as a function of data. Go to Kyle. Hi, I just wanted to say something about uh, composability and uh, this idea of uncertainty quantification, and that's also certainly a lesson that comes on the physics side. So, Neil, you were saying that you know we, we feel comfortable if we can't get it quite right, we'd rather be over overestimate the uncertainty, and that's definitely the kind of thing that you hear experimental physicists saying all the time, like, we don't know, well, let's just be conservative and inflate the error bars. But one of the things that's uh, uh, unexpected is that when you start composing those things together in some complicated way, so for instance, I have a lot of uh, measurements of different things and I put them together, if you overestimate some uncertainties along the way, you can actually completely uh, underestimate the uncertainties of the composed thing. So it's actually not a panacea and, uh, and you should be very careful about uh, overestimating uh, the uncertainties. So I think we have to work a little harder. Uh, yeah. Point. Uh, comments on that? Mr. Gu. Yeah. Um, other question on this side. So my question is, <clears throat> typically in the Bayesian framework, when we try to do inference or we try to model some distribution, we assume that the distribution is either continuous or discrete. But essentially, we typically, when we start writing a probabilistic problem, we write a density with respect to something. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is really not true. And so, for example, um, I, I want to ask a concrete question, which is how would you measure uncertainty when you have a distribution that lies on a low dimensional manifold, for example? That's not continuous, nor discrete, but it's really important, such as, for example, distributions that lie on spaces like natural images. Someone want to take that? Certainty in what precisely? In the or, model or? No, if you have, for example, a, pro, a model that predicts y give, that, that tries to model a multimodal distribution of y given x or even just probability of x, but it's a probability distribution that lies on a low dimensional manifold, yes. for example. It, there is no entropy because the likelihood of this model is clearly defined. You could measure variance or something like this, but is that the right thing to do or do you think it's an important well, problem usually, or not? Usually you imagine that um, it's not actually lying on this low dimension manifold. There's also a bit of noise in the directions, right? It also, it always occupies you know, the entire space in some sense, I think. And so you could put a probability distribution over the manifold by putting a little bit of mass orthogonal to it. Um, or alternatively, you could first map your space into a latent space, right? And then in this latent space, that's a lower dimensional space. And then you could put your probability distribution on that lower dimensional space, perhaps. Um, yeah. There are different ways of approximating the entropy from samples that you could apply. I mean, they're not great, but they're, they're something. I was just going to say more generally, this seems to be a property of all high dimensional problems anyway. Uh, just that is to say that in high dimensions, these probabilities are little fuzzy shells, uh, kind of no matter what. Question on the left. I, um, right, even. <laughs> Um, so uh, I, I, I don't really know much, I just hear stories. And one of the stories I heard in a class is you can sort of think about uh, intelligence in two ways. One way is you have a hierarchical model, you have a classifier and another classifier, which is the way that people be build uh, neural networks. The other sort of intelligence is like similarity-based. Um, you just pull the nearest neighbors and propagate their labels, that's your label. Um, I sort of see uh, kernel methods are sort of uh, these uh, nearest neighbor based methods, despite all the other arguments as, say, global approximator or some things. So I was wondering um, how do you think it's sort of kernel methods a way to sort of 
estimate uncertainties better, or um, what's your take on kernel methods in general? There can be a lot of drawbacks to a particular fixed kernel. Like you mentioned nearest neighbors, and so I assume you're thinking of using an RBF kernel to implement something resembling nearest neighbors. One reason that kernel methods can be somewhat weak is if you don't actually learn the kernel, then you don't know which directions in space matter the most. Right. So imagine that you have a problem with a thousand different dimensions, and imagine that only one of those dimensions is relevant to the classification. If you compare random points in that space, the distance between them determining which neighbors are nearest will mostly be a function of you know, the 999 dimensions that don't matter. And so your classifier will output more or less random things if your data set is small and, and there aren't uh, near neighbors that have slight variations in only the feature that's relevant to the class. If there's a catch, sorry, just let me complete the question. Uh, the, if the data set is small. So when the data set is large, it's another story. I really don't know the details, but uh, back uh, many years ago, Angyosha and a uh, few others had a paper that you can sort of use big data and nearest neighbor approaches to do some sort of interesting image stuff. I mean, if the data set is large. If, if the data set gets really, really large, lots of models start to make the same prediction, and then the question is mostly what's the most efficient to implement, or, or what gives us some other representation of the data that we can use? Yeah, I think, I think most of the people on stage would probably agree that the distinction between, uh, you know, between things like neural networks and, uh, and kernel methods is actually not as, as, as great as maybe uh, it kind of looks like, right? That uh, Gaussian processes, as Zubin talked about in, in his sort of historical overview, uh, arose as in, you know, uh, being viewed as infinite limits of, uh, uh, of neural networks. And there's a large number of connections, of course. I mean, the kernel trick itself is, is all about lifting this representation that really is, is a projection into some basis. And neural networks are a way of adaptively discovering that basis. So this is exactly like what Ian was saying. You gotta, you know, if you're in a crappy basis, then nothing's gonna work. And if you, if you learn that basis, then things have a chance. And that might be something you could do with the kernel or something you can do with a, a neural network. I, I think it's, um, they're, somewhat, they're some, somehow sort of cosmetically different, but I don't think they're fundamentally different. I would really say that a neural net is just a kernel machine where you, you explicitly learn the kernel. I'm a huge fan of kernels, actually. And the thing that I think is most nice is when we ask this question of uncertainty. So it's really hard to learn a probability distribution over all these parameters. So then you'd say to yourself, well, why do that? Why don't I sidestep it? I can put a pry over all the functions directly. It's the most elegant solution I think ever created. So you don't actually need to maintain the parameters. So I hope next year we'll have a workshop on Bayesian deep kernel methods or something like that to really bring all of them together. Neil would love to. <laughs> Well, we don't need a workshop on it. It's done already. No. We had it last week. <laughs> and kernel well, methods these days uh, are very. I think that scalable. that's the interesting question. I, I think you're, you're absolutely right that uh, composing Gaussian processes together is the solution for all problems. But um, having said that, uh, I think that the really interesting thing about what works in the real world is not about the models we can imagine. Zubin talked wonderfully, is something I totally agree with, that we don't do enough when we think conceptually about the separation between model and algorithm. And I personally think the big success of deep learning in these other areas is the conflation of model and algorithm. It's not that you can think of the most elegant model, because mathematically, those models, I agree totally, Shakira, are far more elegant than the, the, the deep, uh, well, than the neural network. But it's conceptually, when you try and fit them, there's just this conflation of model and algorithm seems to get you a lot further. And, and that's, a, that's something that's difficult to design into your method at, at the start. Uh, it relies on GPUs being invented and all sorts of other things and SGD working. I think the recent advances in learning to learn is basically this, right? It's basically saying don't separate uh, modeling from optimization. Treat them as one package and, and just learn to optimize your models. And I think it's quite powerful. I think, it's, but I think that's almost the traditional approach. Like Bayesian influence sort of tells you not to do that. Right? I agree. So the, so, and, and so we yeah. try and avoid it. But I think that what we should do is know when we're doing it and when we're not doing it and why. So I think that we have to be conscious of those choices. I don't know if I completely agree with this. That's good. So the like framework that. that we have is there is a model, there is an inference, and there is an algorithm. And it is not good to forget that there are three steps. Right? In the learning to learn framework, there is a model, there is an inference that is maximum likelihood, and then the algorithm is what puts these two things together.
Yes, then you can say you can build an RNN that gives you the parameters, but underlying the principle of inference is very clear, the principle of the model, and its task is very clear. And I think, yes, when you build the algorithm, then you need to put all these things together like we do for the VAE, then we don't make a distinction anymore because that is the solution that is scalable, but when we forget to make this distinction, that's when we fail to cite the correct history, then we fail to see the, the other connections, we actually slow ourselves down because we don't realize that someone else has solved the problem or take inspiration from these things. So I think there's a balance to keep in mind. That's maybe all I'm saying. Sure, but it, it, it is that in, in the old days, uh, the philosophy, was, philosophy always was, you know, model first, prior, likelihood, think about this very hard, and once you're done, you know, then devise your optimization algorithm. I think that paradigm is, go is starting to break. And I think for good reasons. It's, it's, not, uh, it's just not optimal it, it, to, to keep these things separated. You can actually gain some extra performance if you treat it as one package. Let me tease that apart a bit because I want to bring Kyle's comment back in as well. I mean, and, and task specificity comes in again because you're saying that in the context of what we do, which is just general predictions. But if, if we were talking about physics or we were talking about statistics models we believe in, then we would be back to Shakir's world uh, to a large extent. I agree. Actually, uh, we have a paper submitted to iClear, and it turns out there's much earlier work in this field as well, um, where you can actually uh, you know, build in the physics of the world or your generative model, you build it into this sort of, uh, sort of learning to in infer or learning to optimize. Right? So it, it's not necessarily that you cannot actually express your, your, your prior knowledge about the world or your generative model or your causal model or whatever, you cannot bake that into these, into these learning to optimize models as well. I kind of just want to observe that I, I, totally, I totally agree with what you said, Max, about, about uh, thinking harder about, about algorithms as we you know, as we're building models, but I, I think it's worth pointing out that this is exactly the frequentist paradigm, right? Um, and that is to say, you know, you have some some model of the world, and then you you uh, form, you turn that into an estimator, come up with some kind of algorithm, and then prove properties of that of that algorithm. And um, and so there is this kind of like entire other world, in a sense, for, separate from this the stuff we're talking about in this workshop. That's entirely about you know ensuring that these. Uh, that these things have good computational properties and good estimation properties. Uh, you know, the first example that comes to mind is something like you know uh, using L1 for sparsity, right? Uh, incredibly popular, incredibly successful, been around for decades, and that's a computational choice in forming a model, right? It lets you have this uh, sort of convex relaxation of a problem that otherwise would be very hard in order to in order to estimate uh, in order to estimate sparsity. I think that's a really good example because an L1 prior from a Bayesian perspective, I've tried and tried no. and tried and I can think of no justification. No, there isn't one, yeah. I don't think. I mean, uh, there's other no, than, there's, other than there's you're trying sparks, to make right. a model that looks like Lasso and get it published. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, sorry yeah. for anyone who's done that. <laughs> but, but I, it, it, and, it, this, and I think coming back to Shakir's point from earlier, this separation is, that's the foundation stone of the Church of Bayes, that, but it relies on the idea that your model is correct. And uh, it's suboptimal when your model isn't. And I think this point Ryan makes about what the frequentists do, they try and analyze that entire pipeline. I, I view this as orthogonal to being Bayesian, by the way. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, that we can still do all of that for Bayesian procedures. Just Precisely, yeah. I'll just make a comment. There are very many good reasons to put a Laplace approximation because you have knowledge about what you want your posterior to look like. You want to induce sparsity. Sparsity is important for Laplace a Bayesian prior. agent. Not the Laplace approximation, Laplace prior. Yeah, but the Laplace prior isn't naturally sparse. It's um, actually it dense. In a Bayesian no, it doesn't. In a Bayesian only, sense, it's, it's dense. Not Bayesian sparsity. It's not Bayesian sparsity. Well, it's, uh, the definition sparsity. of Bayesian sparsity we define in two different ways. We have weak sparsity and strong sparsity. I don't want to get I'll too just into say this, but that <laughs> <laughs> there are many good reasons depending on the, the tail properties the point you want is, and what the kind map of solution. structural so where's properties Matthias? you want. Where's Zager? He's worked on this. The map solution is sparse, but the posterior is not sparse. Uh, Matthias Zager's somewhere. He's worked on this. Yeah, yeah, As we've got more questions, perhaps a follow-up comment from Zubin to the little debate there, and uh, then we'll go to the two questions either side. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, I was pointing at the other A follow-up question, Zubin, yeah. or, or, uh, or an well, independent Well, a one? backtracking one. I wanted to come back to the separation of models. Okay, then I'm going to backtrack to you in a moment, and uh, I don't know who's first, but I'll take Julian on the right. Uh, thank you. 
Just, uh, you said earlier that, well, we combine old fields and expect new citations, and you guys on the stage have, uh, beyond Bayesian, been extremely successful in connecting different fields. I mean, if I name the graphs with neural nets for Max's poster here, Ryan on the opti sequential optimization with neural nets, so deep recurrent GPs, I mean, you combine everything here on this stage. So, off the top of your head, and to be a bit forward-looking, what is your next crazy zany combination that we haven't done yet and that you'd love you'd have time to work on? <laughs> well, no one's going to say because they want to put it on archive in 10 minutes. <laughs> TensorFlow algorithm, five lines, archive done. I'll, I'll, I'll throw one out there. I, I mean, I think it's time for us as a community to really revisit control systems. Uh, I, I think this is something that's incredibly important for a lot of the problems we actually care about. And we're, you know, and, and, and some aspects of reinforcement learning uh, that, that are going on right now look a lot like that. But I think the, that, uh, if, you know, for my part, that's a literature I'd like to, I'd like to, to sort of, you know, go back to my undergrad days and reason more closely. Actually, I just thought of one too. I think incorporating causality. You already put it on your slide, but you, you put everything that. on your slide, so that's yeah, not yeah, fair. Yeah, you still have everything. It had, it had control, <laughs> didn't it, basically, under a different name, causality. Right. Yeah. I think putting causality in our models, I think, is going to be big at some point. So I think if I would, if I would want to work on something and I would have the sort of capacity to do so, I think that, that would be really interesting. Maybe incorporating it with, you know, since we're combining, maybe combining deep learning with causality then. Maybe a bit of Bayesian sauce over it. Okay, I just want to take, we've only got five minutes left, so let's take the quick question on the left of the hall. Recently, uh, there are many uh, research on deep generative models, but uh, most of them are uh, variants of VAEs or GANs. Do you think uh, such, a uh, such a fundamental models would appear in the future, other than VAE and GAN? I think you're already seeing a lot of interesting variations of models. So the new kinds of models that you're seeing are models with discrete latent variables, for example. So maybe you still think of that as a VAE. Uh, that's okay. Then you have temporal models. There are lots of interesting work in temporal models. Um, models that do sort of non-parametric stick-breaking priors that are coming in that fuse more things. I think there are many different kinds of models that are coming up, more than just this basic framework of GANs and VAEs. In GANs, we see these pixel-to-pixel -pixel or sketched images, so I think already you've seen a lot and it's just going to be more. Maybe you wanna... It seems like the number of categories of uh, generative models is increasing over time at an increasing rate, so if we're going to extrapolate linearly, then uh, we'd, we'd predict there'd be even more of them, but that's probably not quite the right thing to do. And I'd also just point out that thinking of, of uh, things like GANs and VAEs as being generative models in this community is a relatively recent phenomenon, and that generative models sort of meant something else, and in particular graphical models uh, and things like that for, for most of the time I think we've been using that phrase. One more thing, I think uh, simulators are gonna be also very interesting. So in, in the community outside of machine learning, if you talk to a physicist or you talk to an astronomer or a biologist, they all built simulators. That's the way they express their prior knowledge of the world. I think we could do a lot more there um, in our field as, as, a, as a generative model. I, I would say GANs and VAEs are a kind of graphical model just with a particular CPD and a particular cost function for training it. But uh, it's, it's not a very interesting graphical model. It's a bipartite complete graph, but it, it is one. Okay, so uh, we'll go for Zubin's question now. I backtrack to Zubin. Okay, well, now I have another one as well. Um, <laughs> no, I just wanted to comment about simulators. I really like that, that point that, you know, we, wanna inter we don't want to live in our own bubble of playing with images and feeling good about ourselves. Um, we want to interact with uh, the rest of the world that does medicine, engineering, finance, physics, whatever. And they have built a lot of complicated simulations. So whether you you think of those simulators as probabilistic programs, for example, or you think of them as differentiable simulators. I think both of those are quite nice ways of interfacing them directly with our world here in this room. Um, uh, I wanted to come back with the, the separation of models and kind of inference methods and sort of that's something that, that we take very seriously in Bayesian methods, but just because we separate the model from the inference algorithm doesn't mean that 
there for for any model there isn't a search over good inference methods that's going to be specific to that model it also probably shouldn't mean that we shouldn't change our model if we're going to be rational i think rationality trumps being bayesian okay um so if we have limited um computational resources and some interesting objective function that we need to achieve we should do whatever is rational and sometimes it's rational to be very dogmatically bayesian sometimes it's rational to make a really you know brutal approximation sometimes it's rational just to be totally non-bayesian and and do something quick right and so co-evolving the model and the the um algorithm is something that i feel is quite rational that's happened in the deep learning community right we have our architectures like relus relus don't correspond to some inductive bias about the real world they correspond to a really good thing to stick in a neural network if we want to do gradient descent right um so anyway just f food for thought like uh, let's not take the separation to um religiously like it's kind of be rational about things maybe uh, in the last 30 seconds perhaps uh, everyone wants to just sum up but there was a couple of questions whether do you think we is there enough material for a, a workshop next year and uh, what are the big challenges in Bayesian deep learning so brief summary from each of you on that start with uh, we can start with Shakir actually since we started with Max before so I, I think we've, we've mentioned all the key points actually evaluation will continue to be important um, ways of thinking about building posterior distributions of, of parameters, but the things I would really like to see are uh, new work in um, inference on discrete models where we can build richer posteriors of a discrete latent variables rather than just mean field that we currently do, and new methods for inference in non-parametric methods, because I would like us as a Bayesian community to start thinking more about memory systems. And we are very silent right now, but we have so much to say, and so in, this is the, 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 I think, maybe four things that we should really all do. Great. Ian. I'd like to see somebody next year come back here with a method that can integrate over enough different functions that it isn't fooled into believing in just one that's vulnerable to a large set of adversarial examples. Great. I, I would be more interested in uh, looking at the relationship between models uh, and the uncertainty estimates that we would be obtaining from those models. We have seen a lot of work here based on uh, these uh, Bayesian deep neural networks, but there are other modeling approaches, like for example, Neil mentioned this uh, deep Gaussian processes, and I would be interested in uh, <laughs> I would be interested in uh, uh, studying uh, more the differences in the uncertainty estimates that you would be obtaining between different uh, modeling techniques. I'm quite interested in, uh, in, in really thinking hard about this question about priors, like how can we build more and more structure uh, in, into our models and, and make that useful? And maybe the answer is simulation, as, as Max said. So if I, I would want to do one thing, it is actually come up with a good set of metrics and benchmarks. So in the computer vision community, they basically have accelerated their research by having fantastic data sets and being able to figure out who does better than who. Um, and that has revolutionized that field, and I think we are fooling around, basically. We write papers on UCI data sets right now, and I think that's, we just, that needs to change in order to accelerate this field. Great. Um, well, I think if we could just thank uh, the whole panel for a great... Um